Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 8 on internal forced convection. And I'm going to do a part now, which is not in the textbook, which we call mixed convection. Uh, we've made some notes already available to you uh, on ClickUp, and you can download all the notes from there. Now, the very important thing is, so let's, ju let's just define with what we mean with mixed convection. And the mixed convection work that we're going to give to you will be for a constant heat flux. In principle, it would be relevant also to the case of a constant wall temperature. It is just the equations that's going to look different, but the principles is going to be exactly the same. We spoke about it in many cases. If we have a tube with flow through it, and then it is being heated, typically by putting in a current through it or an electrical wire that is coiled around it, then you're going to have some, uh, a case of a constant heat flux. So the amount of watts per square meter or per meter length will be a constant. If we have a case like that, then we have to distinguish between the developing part and the fully developed part. So that's the Nusselt number as a function of x. And the Nusselt number is actually going to do something like that. And for the case of a constant heat flux, that will go to 4.36. That has been theoretically been derived in your textbook. And for a constant wall temperature, it's about 3.3 or 3.6, something like that. However, if you go and try to do this experimentally, you'll find you almost never get this. So this almost never happened. I don't want to say never, but it's close to never. <laughs> uh, we have tried for years experimentally to get this right. And uh, we started with that more than 10, 15 years ago. And I had a poor student that I sent, keep on sending back to the laboratory because he couldn't get 4.36. And it took us years to, to, to discover that you can only get this when you've got very, very careful experiments with very, very low heat fluxes. Because you end up with experiments here where the temperature difference between the wall and the fluid order of magnitudes is less than 0.1 degrees Celsius, and then you cannot measure it. So this almost never happens. <clears throat> what happens is that the buoyancy forces, already when you start hitting it in the, in the beginning, will already start having a flow pattern, which we call secondary flow. So these fluids close to the wall is being heated. Their density would decrease and the buoyancy force will then, in, will then cause a flow pattern looking something like that. And that is called secondary flow. And that already happens from the beginning. You can actually see that. But what is going to happen in almost all other cases is you're going to get mixed convection. And that means that this circulation is going to become stronger and stronger as you go downstream to the tube, up to the point where the boundary layer that is starting to increase and increase starts decreasing again. And the result is you get something like this. For a specific case of a constant heat flux. So it will break away from the forced convection line it will start developing more and more until it's fully developed up to that point, and only from there on it will be a constant. And these values typically can be about three times higher than 4.36. So that is normally what you are going to measure. Now, to properly understand that, we've generated that flow regime map on the board. Carl, if you can show that. Dr. Everts already showed it to you. So that is how it looks like. <clears throat> Here we can see the forced convection line in red. 
and then typically how a line would break away at that point there, it would develop up to there, and then it is fully developed. So you will see that there are actually three different regions which we have defined. The first region is called the forced convection region. Forced convection. And then the second part is called the mixed convection developing flow regime. Mixed convection developing. And then the last part would be the fully developed part. So if I can show this in colors, it is something like that. The yellow is the forced convection part. Here is the mixed convection developing part. And the last part in red is the fully developed part. Now to be able to distinguish between these flow regimes, we actually must have these points. And they are defined there. So depending on the heat flux, for lower heat fluxes, we will get something like that. And for higher heat fluxes, something like that. And therefore, we are interested in that line and that line there. And they are being called LT MCD, LT mixed convection developing the line, and the LT line for fully developed. And there are some equations available that you can use to calculate that with. So these lines are for an increase in Grassoff number okay, or heat flux. As the heat flux increases, you'll move up to these lines. You can also, and that is actually preferable if you work with a constant heat flux, work, work with the so-called modified Grassoff number. With the Grassoff number, you need to get the temperature difference between the wall and the fluid. Normally, when you've got a constant heat flux, you've got the heat flux value, and then it is more convenient to use the modified Grassoff number. And for that, there's also a graph. But so that to prevent you from not, so that you don't have to put two graphs into your textbook, we've agreed with you that you only need to put this one into your textbook. There's actually four different graphs. There's the one for the Grassoff number, and then the one for the Grassoff modified for fully developed flow. And then there's, a other, there's another one for developing flow. And I, will, and I will show you the differences just now. You all understand that? Any questions? So let's do an example so that you can understand it a little bit better. So this example consists out of a case where we've got a constant heat flux. Okay, and the tube diameter is 11.5 millimeters, and the length of the tube is 9.5 meters. The bulk temperature is given for us. It's a little bit unusual, but in this case, we're going to give you the bulk temperature of 40. And then the average surface temperature, Ts, to indicate it is the surface temperature average, is going to be 44 degrees Celsius. And the question would be to determine the heat transfer rate. Eleven point five millimeter tube, inner diameter, length of nine point five meters, so it's quite a long tube. Constant heat flux, the bulk temperature you can assume to be forty. The average wall temperature is 44 degrees Celsius, and the question is to determine the heat transfer rate. To get the heat transfer rate, there are two methods that, that we can use. We can use m, m dot Cp delta T and determine it from the temperature difference, but in this case we do not give you the inlet temperature, neither the outlet temperature, so you cannot do, do it like that. So the un only possibility is to calculate it 
saying it is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area delta T. <coughs> oh, and I forgot to mention, we did give the mass flow rate, which is equal to 0 0.0064 kilograms per second. Okay. Now, at a bulk temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, we can go and get all the properties, and they are a density of 992.1 kilograms per cubic meter. The viscosity is equal to 0.653 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms meters per second. Thermal conductivity K is equal to 0.631 watts per meter Kelvin. The Pranol number is equal to 4.32 and beta is equal to 0.377 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3, 1 over Kelvin, and I forgot to mention it's water. Water, mass flow rate of 0.0064, length of the tube 9.5 meters, bulk temperature 40. Average wall temperature you can take as 44, and the question is to determine the heat transfer rate. So let's start to determine if the flow is laminar or turbulent. It's a circular tube, therefore we can say the Reynolds number is equal to the mass flow rate, the diameter divided by the viscosity and the cross-sectional area. equal to 0 0.0064 multiplied by 0 0.0158, the diameter, divided by the viscosity 0 0.653 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3, cross-sectional area is pi divided by 4, 0 0.0015 square, and the Reynolds number is then equal to 1,085. That's important because it tells us if the flow is laminar or turbulent, is lower than 2,100 to 2,300, therefore we can say the flow is laminar. Okay, if the flow is laminar, let's just look on our map. There's the map, let me just be on this side. So here we've got the Reynolds number and here the Rally number. And we can see to determine if the flow is laminar or turbulent, ach, laminar, laminar forced convection or mixed convection, we need to get the Rally number. Okay. If we get the Rally number, then we can determine that. <coughs> So the rally number is equal to G beta TS minus TB, TB, the diameter to the third multiplied by the prandtl divided by the kinematic viscosity. Okay, the kinematic viscosity, which is equal to the viscosity divided by the density, is equal to 6.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 7, I think, square meters per second. Okay. Calculate the rally number. G is 9.81 multiplied by beta. 0.377 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3. Temperature difference 44 minus 40. 0 0.0115 to the third multiplied by 4.32, the Pranel number, divided by 2.24 multiplied by 10 to the 5. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. 
5A2 multiplied by 10, it seems as if it's minus 7. I can go, yeah, minus 7. <coughs> And the result is a rally number of 2.24 multiplied by 10 to the 5. Okay. Yep. Does it matter which order the temperature and the surface temperature is? Does it matter if? The, the order of it. The order of it. Yeah. How do you mean in terms of the calculation here? Of, okay, so it can give you a negative or a positive uh, ra uh, rally number. So normally, because it's heating, constant heat flux, practically, it is always, you know, higher temperature to a lower temperature. Theoretically, of course, you can do it the other way around. If it is the other way around, we just adjust it there and write the rally number the other way around. So we don't have negative... Uh, rally numbers or Brownell numbers or Reynolds numbers, we usually ch take the highest one minus the lowest one. Okay. Right. So, now remember that I've told you that when you've got a constant heat flux case, you almost never get this. So, you will be 99.99% correct if you guess it is mixed convection. So go and look on the, on the chart. <coughs> Most probably, for those of you who have it with you, please open it up. And if you can look at the Raleigh number and the Reynolds number, I think you will see it is clearly mixed convection. Okay. So if you look at that chart, the Reynolds number as a function of Raleigh number, I'm not going to try to, to draw that chart, but you will see that you end up here, and therefore the flow regime is definitely mixed convection. Okay? Let's just determine these lengths in terms of where it breaks away and where it will be fully developed. But before we do that, let's just calculate Okay, now remember, this is for forced convection. For forced convection, this length would be 0.12 Reynolds Pranel diameter. I'm not going to put in all the values there, but that would be 6.49 meters. I'm going to use it a little bit later. Now remember, this is for forced convection. It is not for mixed convection. So for mixed convection, we are going to have LT MCD and that was equal to 2.4 times the Reynolds number, the Pranel number to the 0.6, the diameter, divided by Grasov to the 0.52. Okay. I've calculated the, the Grasov, uh, the rally number, Let's just also calculate the Grasov number because that is going to be used, as you can see there. Now, the Grasov number is just the rally number divided by the Pronel number. The rally number divided by the Pronel number. So this term will just disappear for the Grasov number, and that is going to be equal to 5.19 multiplied by 10 to the fourth. Now, LT MCD is equal to 0.254 meters. We'll come back to that just now. And then the other length, LT FD, is equal to D multiplied by 130. 130 multiplied by the Reynolds number divided by the Grasov number to the 0.4, Pranel number to the 0.65, everything to the 10th divided by 13. Again, all the values are there. I'm not going to bore you 
and the result is 1.79 meters. Okay. So what does it mean? It means that if we look at this chart of the missile number as a function of x, and this is the total length of 9.5 meters, we're going to have something like that if it is forced convection only. If it's forced convection, oh, maybe my scale is not so good. Let me do it. Because it says from 6.49 meters, so 6.49, let me do it like that. There you go. So that would be the distance LT and that is equal to 6.49 meters. As I've mentioned, that would almost never happen if the flow is forced convection only. What does happen is at 250 millimeters from here, it already breaks away. My scale here is not good. And then in 1.79 meters, it is going to be fully developed like that. So that is equal to 0.254. And that is equal to 1.79 meters before it is fully developed. So that is how it really looks like. <clears throat> So to distinguish these two lines, let's do this one in yellow. That is therefore the force convection case. Just to check, we are actually going to do the calculations based on the force convection case of a missile number of 4.36. We will, however, have the case of mixed convection, which is that case there, and it means that the flow is going to, the boundary layer is going to start growing until the circulation is so strong that it will decrease the thickness of the boundary layer, it will go through the mixed convection developing flow regime, and after that it would be fully developed. So that is how it really looks like. And you will immediately see, in terms of the flow regime map, there is an equation that you can now use to calculate the Nusselt number with. And that equation consists out of different parts. It says the Nusselt number is equal to 4.36 plus point of, uh, plus missile 1 plus missile 2 but take note of the overbar there so it indicates the average missile number over the total length and I will come back to it just now so that is the result for mixed convection So if you've got mixed convection, then you need to determine the Nusselt number 1, which is equal to 1 divided by the length minus 0.84, pronal to the minus 0.2, LT, MCV, plus 0.72, multiplied by Reynolds, diameter 0.54 pronal to the 0.34 LT MCD to the 0.46 
So it's a long equation, a little bit of an irritation to calculate it. Now this length is going to be the 9.5 meters length of the tube. We've got the Prandtl number. We have LTMCD. You can put in all the values. I'm not going to write it out. And the result is 0.243. Okay. So that's the first part. And then there's a second part, which is Nussel 2, which is equal to 1 divided by the length, 0.207. Grass off to the 0 0.305 minus 1.19, Pranel to the 0.42, Reynolds divided by the diameter minus 0 0.08, L minus LT MCD. And if you've put in all these values, you'll see it is equal to 6.6. .6. Now, if you're going to get to this in the test and exam, you are surely going to think I hate you. Okay. Because it is just calcs, and most probably you're going to make a finger error. Okay. So as an engineer, what do I do? Do I do this? No. Look at the plot. Go and look at the plot. Okay. So you can obviously do it more accurately than I can do it. But if you look at the plot of the Nusselt number, oh, the Reynolds number is 1,085. We've made this a linear scale, so therefore it must be, must be possible for you to determine that. And the Grassoff number, which is 5.19 multiplied by 10 to the 4, according to the color, you can see that from the graph, the Nusselt divided by the Nusselt of forced convection is equal to, and that is how I've read it from the graph, 2.569. You agree? Can you all do it? Yep, question? Uh, do you mean on that over on the, on the equation I wrote down? Uh, I can't see very well. Just look at that equation up there. It's exactly the same. So just use the one there on the PowerPoint. It's the one that we've already seen to you. So you should have it. Okay? Okay. Does it matter? Most probably I might, I might end a writing error. And that's most probably what you're also going to do in the test and exam. Okay. Do you agree with me that this ratio is 2.569? You all lie if you say that. Well, exactly, that's my point. <laughs> I can't. So I don't really think you can do it better than saying it's about 2.6. But you'll, get, you'll be able to get to 2.6. That I promise you. Can you look at it quickly? According to the colors? You should be able to get 2.6. Okay? Okay, so if it is 2.6, if it's 2.6, then it means the Nusselt number, okay, and it is the average, sorry, the Nusselt divided by that, divided by the Nusselt force convection is equal to 2.6 multiplied by 4.36. And that will give you a value of 11.3. You agree? You'll get it close to that. Even if you don't agree with my 2.6, maybe you'll get to 2.7 or 2.5, but most probably you'll get close to that value. So take note, it's 11, it is not 4.36. So the secondary flow really enhances the transfer quite a lot. According to the equation, if we use the equation, which is then equal to 4.36 plus Nusselt 1 plus Nusselt 2 
then it should actually be 11.2. Okay. So it's very close, close enough for design purposes. If you want to do optimization or a very, very detailed design, then you can go and use the equation, but I would recommend in the test and exam, use the graph, it's fine. Um, yes, because this is now already, there's the 4.36 in it. The 4.36 plus the other two terms, and I'm going to explain to you just now where it comes from. Okay. Okay, so, in terms of this equation, let's just look at the background of this equation. The 4.36, now remember, this value is, this is not 11.2. This is the average of everything, the 11.2. It's the fully developed part, the average already, if it's fully developed flow. So this actually, take into consideration this area here. So this is the 4.36 part. Takes into consideration that area. The 0.254 is actually That part there, and the last one, which is then the 6.6 .6 part, is actually this part here. Okay. Not exactly 4.36 multiplied by 9.95, but it has already been taken care of. This is just to show you the different areas, the background in terms of where does the equation comes from. Right, so now that we've got the average Nusselt number, we can say that the average Nusselt number is of course equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter divided by K. This Nusselt number of 11.2 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the length of 0 0.0115 divided by the thermal conductivity 0.631 and that gives us the heat transfer coefficient of 614.56 watts per square meter. Okay, coming back to this curve. Okay. So this value of 11.2 will actually be that value there, the average. So it will take this value and it will integrate the other areas and put them all together. Now that we've got the heat transfer coefficient, we can calculate the heat transfer rate, which is going to the heat transfer coefficient, the area, and because it's a constant heat flux case, we do not have to use the LMTD. The heat transfer coefficient is equal to 614.56 surface area pi multiplied by the diameter, 0 0.0115, multiplied by the length, temperature difference, 44, 4 minus 40. Oh, don't have to divide it. So it is equal to 843.7 watts. You follow that? Now, if we would have assumed it is forced convection, which is incorrect, look what the answer would have been. If it's forced convection, then it means the Nusselt number is 4.36. 
It will of course be this value of 4.36 and it will not take that into consideration. But if you've assumed the flow is fully developed equal to 4.36, then the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient, the diameter divided by the thermal conductivity. Nusselt number is 4.36 equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter 0.0115 divided by the thermal conductivity 0.631 and that would give us a heat transfer coefficient of 239.23 watts per square meter degree Celsius So if we look at the heat transfer coefficient, we can see that it is actually 614, but with forced convection, it will estimate a value of 239. So if we calculate the heat transfer with forced convection, it's equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, Ts minus Tb. So we repeat everything, but now with a new value of the forced convection heat transfer coefficient, pi multiplied by 0, 0.115, 44 minus 40, and that gives us a transfer rate of 328.4 watts, which is only 39%. of the actual value. I see there are some of you battling. Please ask, can I help you? You're all fine? Okay. So I repeat again, I would definitely not recommend that you go to the test and exam without those charts, without that chart and those equations. We've given it to you, please use it, as well as the old equations like the Dittes and Boulter, the Sider and Tate and the Glinsky equations. Please, you need to replace them with the latest ones available. Question? For the constant heat flux case, the question was, should we always check for mixed convection? I would say yes. As a matter of fact, as I've said, 99.99% of the cases will most probably mix, mix, mix convection. Once we understood this, we went back to all, uh, all our old experiments and we could actually understand why we always get Nusselt numbers of about three to four times higher than 4.36 and we couldn't get 4.36. Later on we did, but it took us a few years to actually do these experiments. Very difficult to do. Okay, now take note, this chart has been developed for constant heat flux. There isn't there isn't one for a constant wall temperature. So if you would like to do that, please come and do your master's and your PhD. It's going to take you five years, but it also still needs to be developed. But it should be something similar. Okay? Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.